I think when, you know, you have these, they're obviously the Bitcoin maximalists. They're kind of this group of Ethereum maximalists as well, right? And my thing has always been like smart contracts is too big for one platform. Do you even want everything on one platform? That has never really fundamentally made a lot of sense to me. But I do think, so I, and I want to get into your guys' vision of what a multi-chain kind of future looks like. But let's talk about, because I think that you hit on exactly the right point, John, which is the developers that are kind of working on each uh, project. So, and I totally agree that uh, I see Ethereum and Avalanche being very complementary to another one another. How do you go about attracting developers, right, to your platform? How do you build that community? And what are the kind of the value props that they'd be weighing against, say, building on Ethereum versus building on Avalanche? Right. So in order to answer that question, we ha I have to give you our bigger view first, our meta view. Um, we don't see it like I call it crypto wave number two, which is like winner take all on Ethereum. We see it more like the way social media uh, platforms have proliferated in the web world where you have a winner take most like a Facebook, but then you have these vertical specialists and other players who are taking um, not share, but creating great alternative products and have a lot of nice business. Yeah, now Clubhouse, the latest one, but yeah, TikTok, you have, you know, and then suddenly you have mergers where Instagram gets brought in into, you know, Facebook. So Snapchat again. So you have different type of specialties coming around. So um, the flow example that Paul just talked about, I mean, I think they their, their blockchain fundamentally is a, a, a classical a consensus protocol, which has a different um, characteristics than R, which is, you know, they, they are, their competitive advantage is be, it's more of a business development edge and creating, as Paul said, brand around a specific you know, niche. So that's what they're focused on. And they're not optimizing for the same things we're optimizing. You know, we're basically trying to uh, grow from a technology perspective. You know, if you look at all the devs that have come, uh, the 300 we just talked about earlier, and we've surveyed some of them, their main reason is basically they want speed and low cost. And that is why they're coming here. So the, the devs who are on Flow or the you know, DAP developers there, um, they're going there for a different reason. So let's break out uh, the macro view into the micro view. So we're attracting fundamentally different types of people to begin with. Yeah, I'll, uh, I, guess, I guess from my point of view, I could probably, I'm not gonna add as, as much as John because he's gonna know sort of his differentiation versus uh, Ethereum and others. I, I guess from what I'm hearing from entrepreneurs uh, on, on how they sort of choose platforms to work with, I think that's, that's basically it. I mean, they, they're, they're seeing a problem here around scalability and especially for their particular use case, if it is something that needs more throughput, you know, they are gonna be, you know, there's more of an urgency to sort of search for that answer. And that's why they are going to other platforms like Avalanche and, and Polkadot. I think the other thing to sort of highlight too is, you know, uh, to, 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 to work with another platform and to, you know, sort of make that huge decision, they also do want to have a good, I guess, relationship and customer support. So I've heard from entrepreneurs that, you know, if they're going to take this leap and, and sort of go against the grain of just jumping on Ethereum, you know, they really just want to be able to sort of know that, you know, if anything arises, any problems or anything like that, that, you know, these guys have their back and they're willing to sort of dedicate the time and the resource to really just kind of get them sort of up to speed and get them going, whether it's just from a technology perspective or whether it's even just a little bit from a business perspective on sort of how to sort of get started. So uh, I, I think that's been a bit of a differentiator for some of the, you know, up and coming blockchains too, is just to just to kind of cater to some of those needs. And I think that makes a lot of sense for, you know, these, these platforms too, because, you know, you can, you can boil the ocean, but I think if you just find a few strong use cases and case studies and nurture those guys, then it just draws more attention to your platform. So I think, I think that's a win-win situation for, for both sides. Paul, Paul is exactly right. I think if you even look at the, these next generation smart contract platforms, if you will, whether it's us or Polkadot or Solana or Algorand, we have approached this um, populate the ecosystem or how do you acquire your users and developers slightly differently. Um, partially it's because we're all at different stages in terms of history. Like we've been, we're probably the youngest of, of the crowd. Um, 
we've been focused on um, the support to developers. We started the whole thing with a, a blockchain architecture that made it very easy for developers. We have, we're EVM compatible. Um, you know, guys can eat whatever they're using to develop smart contracts in Ethereum. They have the same experience with us. And then we spent a lot of time, BD has been more about structure and uh, infrastructure and tool support, partnering with people who can provide that for developers. If I look at, um, you know, Polkadot, um, you know, they're doing similar things, but I think their emphasis has been, you know, again, what, what I was saying is throwing resources to developers in different ways. You know, we do it by a more tech oriented, you know, manner, almost like a, a service provider for technologists. Polkadot has um, used money probably to, to, to do a lot more than we have. They have great ecosystem funds. They partner with other VCs. And you know their resource providing has probably emphasized a little more on dollar spent. We're we're doing we're about to do that as well, but we focused on the tech and actual consulting slash service provider. You know every one of these little firms has their slight different approach to it, but I think the end result is we're all trying to acquire users, we're all trying to acquire developers, and hopefully. Um, that developer coming to us in, the, in three, four years from now is feels comfortable um, and that asset can flow all over in, in an interoperable ecosystem. So when you think about the future and you just talked about an interoperable ecosystem, let's say you know three, five years out, what do you think the composition of different platforms looks like? Like what is that multi-chain future? How does that actually look? Paul, you wanna take that first or? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to take that first. I mean, you know, I, I don't see it. I don't see it being too different from now. I mean, in, in, the, in the sense that like right now, I mean, even even at this early going, you know, to me, I, I see it being Ethereum as the leader and, um, you know, Polkadot and Avalanche, you know, sort of right behind and and then you have you know guys also like like near and others that are you know you know i think maybe even a little earlier on the developer side but again have some differentiation that can kind of get them up to sort of that that top group but i do feel like there are going to be a few winners maybe a handful of winners and um you know similar to social networks right just some slight differentiation um so not a winner take all but a winner take most and then uh, other platforms is kind of standing out for one reason or another. And then I do see uh, some more vertically focused uh, blockchains out there for, you know, specific use cases. It could be gaming, it could be maybe around, you know, healthcare, it could be something around real estate, something like that, where the differentiation there, as, as John has also pointed out, is, is really more on the business development and branding and tooling and potentially just brand out there. So uh, to me, like, I do feel like it's going to be a, you know, a few blockchains that really just sort of stand out. And then you'll just have sort of like uh, industry focused blockchains out there. And then of course you'll have, uh, you know, some either, you know, companies that provide a bit of, I mean, it could be the chains themselves, but like, I think there'll be a lot of other companies out there just providing tooling around interoperability that'll make it very easy for you to move across these different platforms. So that's kind of how I see the, the world checking out in the future. And, you know, I think as, as investors here, you know, hopefully we would have bet on some of those winners in the earliest of stages for our early stage token fund. But then as we get into, you know, how the world evolves, we'll, you know, hopefully just have a, a position in each of these on the liquid token fund side. And, um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. As I mentioned, more, um, more entrepreneurs that come into this space and they always seem to come in during the, you know, the bull run is just going to bring on more innovation and more competition. And um, I think the more people that we get in to try to solve this problem and as it does get solved, the more really cool applications we can, we can see out there. So I, I agree with most of what Paul said, except for maybe we're hoping Avalanche is the top of that pile, but uh, put, put that little discrepancy aside the other thing I think will be very interesting is um, unlike traditional tech where, at, and while I was an investor, you know, 
And during the Web 1.0 phase, people were investing in infrastructure, telco, telco companies and servers and, and people who made the hardware almost. And then the value chain shifted to the, the, close, the guy who was closer to the end user. And then you moved ultimately to a software provider. Um, and then the capture and the stickiness of the user in a traditional web is why Facebook is so powerful and the network effect that's there. I think in a permissionless world where it's distributed governance, where individuals have, with interoperability means assets and developers and users can easily move around anywhere they want. Having a, a sticky user and having the ability to figure out a lifetime value or user is gonna be very, very hard. So in, in the case of blockchain and crypto, I actually think the equivalent of the infrastructure guy in the web world is where the value in the long run will accrete to. And that's a really, really interesting point. And maybe that's a good uh, point to kind of shift and maybe both of you can kind of put your, your investor hats on here for a second. Um, because one question that I'm very curious about what you guys think about is we talk about value capture versus value accrual. Right? And there's this kind of old, for people who've been around in this space for a little while, there's this old theory about kind of fat protocols, right? And that flipped the script on um, the dynamic in the internet where the protocols, kind of the HTTPs that the internet was built on captured no value and the PayPal, kind of the application layer went on to capture a lot of that value, even though the protocol created a lot of value. In there was a certain period of time where it's very popular to say, well, in crypto, it's the opposite. It's fat protocols and the bottom layer, that's where they're going to capture, actually capture a lot of the value. I'm curious, it's three years later, that's a little less popular than it once was. I'm curious, do you guys have thoughts at all about kind of where the value gets captured in the ecosystem as opposed to just generating value? Paul, I'll let you go first again. You have a more macro yeah. view. Yeah, so, you know, I'd say... Um, you know, if you look at Web 2.0 right now, I mean, again, uh, most of the value or the entire value has been in great companies like Apple, Google, and Facebook, the applications building on top of the underlying protocols, HTTP, uh, et cetera. And it's because no one was able to actually be owners of the underlying protocol. And now what has been changed is, <clears throat> you know, these underlying protocols, we can actually all be owners of. And as these applications, are using uh, the underlying token for transactions and other things around staking and protecting the network, uh, there is going to be more uh, value accrual to the underlying protocol. Um, and especially like if you invested into these protocols fairly early, you know, Bitcoin, you know, our, our Bitcoin fund invested into Bitcoin at, at $40. And so it's like 80,000% returns. You know, if you got into the Ethereum crowd sale, and uh, so I think entry point makes a huge difference. Um, now that you have, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some of these smart contract platforms um, reaching a certain uh, level of, of market cap right now, uh, you, can, you can still make a lot of money by investing into the underlying protocol. And I think, you know, that's where most of the value will be from a market cap perspective. But uh, there's still a lot of value investing into the applications on top because, as I mentioned, the entry price. I mean, if you get into uh, these applications at a you know, $10 million pre-money valuation and these become billion-dollar companies, you, know, you can make a lot more money investing on the application layer in the next two, three years than, than getting, you know, hoping that Avalanche or Ethereum get to 100x in two or three years, right? That, it is probably not going to happen, but you know I can definitely see them getting to you know a good multiple. So uh, I think for us as investors, um, we we think it's uh, doing a bit of both. You know we want to build a diversified portfolio where you are investing into the underlying platforms because uh, they are going to be very strong and steady returns. But then again, like the balance of that with investing into applications where you get more of those moonshot returns really just presents, you know, an overall holistic uh, investment strategy for the entire space where you do sort of capture both value, both from where we think uh, most of the value will accrue, but then also where we think, you know, you'll generate just higher multiples. I think in the internet web 2.0, Facebook 
you know, mobile world, um, these large incumbents like Facebook capture the value. There's kind of been, so the shareholders in theory capture the value. In the crypto blockchain world, because it's distributed, because everyone has an opportunity to be the underlying owner of the protocol, and they are also using it, you know, so both owner and utility, it's really the stakeholders that ultimately will carry the value and vote where they want to go, whether it's layer two or layer one. With that said, I think there is a revolt right now on web 2.0. I mean, when I was a tech investor investing in web 1.0 and 2.0, I saw them growing value. Now I see them as capturing value. They, you know, they went from taking my data and basically using it, doing analytics to optimize my experience, which was perfectly fine. But I feel like now they're taking my data, they own my digital identity. And then what they do with it is they make money, monetize it from me, and then they manipulate me so they can do it even better next time. So the whole web 3.0 is blockchain and crypto where I get my data back. I get my digital identity back. I get self-governance. I get to vote. That is a bigger theme here than whether it's dApps or layer ones capturing the value. It's the, the people will capture the value and they will decide. Stakeholders as, as opposed to just pure shareholders.